young man just graduating from college answered a posting for a job with a new startup company, hadn't been in existence very long, was called in for an interview, and the owner of this small company said, well, I, I, want, I want an accountant, but more than that, I, I want someone that will do my worrying for me. <laughs> and the young man said, well, do your worrying for you? What do you mean? And he said, well, I, want, I want someone that will worry about the money so I can focus on the business. And uh, the young man said, okay, what, what does the position pay? And he said, well, I'll start you at $80,000 a year. And the young man said, $80,000 a year? This is a new startup company. Where are you gonna get the money to pay $80,000 a year? And the owner replied, that's your first worry. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great to outsource worry like that? You know, pay somebody, just outsource the worry. Somebody else can have the third dimple in the front of their forehead. You're fortunate you only have one, Mark. I have several. <laughs> um, worry. It is something that's a part of our lives. And, you know, you can imagine. I don't even have to tell you the worry list. There are all sorts of things we worry about. Collectively, we worry about all kinds of, of things, global issues and problems that we face. But individually, we have a very similar set of worries, money and job and relationships and all the kinds of things that bring worry to us, what tomorrow will bring, what we should have done yesterday, worries. And it really is a part of life. And, and Jesus in this passage on the Sermon on the Mount really is, is sort of uh, sort of walking a tightrope in a way, walking that fine line between concern that leads to something and apathy where there's no concern at all. And so we're going to think about that and what that means for us. But with this, uh, with this issue of worry, you know, sometimes people say, don't worry. And that's not all that helpful. Yesterday, I have this, I sort of am stuck in the past when it comes to my playlist on Pandora, 60s, 70s, and 80s songs that, uh, that it was one of those playlists. And, and that old song, Don't Worry, Be Happy, came on. And, and I thought, what kind of advice really is that? I mean, how, I mean, it's nice advice and it sounds good, but how do you, how do you live into that? Between the services, uh, a member of our church uh, said, I've got a worry story, story for you. He, he recounted how uh, Mickey Rivers, the baseball player, Mick the Quick, uh, was asked one time about something, whether it worried him or not. And he said, me worry? He said, no, I don't worry. He said, if it's something I can control, I don't worry about it, because I can control it. And he said, if it's something I can't control, I don't worry about that because I can't control it. And I thought, how do you get to that place? You know? Because I confess to you that that is a difficult thing for me to even imagine really living into that. But see, the thing about what Jesus is talking about, this kind of worry is, is really... In fact, the word is sometimes translated, don't be anxious about tomorrow in that part of our text. It is, it's anxiety. It's, it's more like a toxic kind of worry. I think that's what he's, he's really warning us about and helping us with in this passage of Scripture. Sharm Robarts, who preaches and is responsible for the Disciple Church service in the chapel at 8.30, sent out an email to her worshiping community this week and I, I love what she wrote about anxiety about this kind of worry it's really it's really poetic as she wrote this she said I made myself think about how anxiety feels and here's what I came up with that uneasy terrain of the mind making our steps tentative and our ears overly sensitive 
so that nouns and verbs are barbed wires in our souls. When we're anxious, we doubt our ability to decide things. We worry about what others are saying. We may wish we could hide away somewhere, somewhere away from the threats to our well-being. These feelings come to us all for one reason or another. And of course, Sharm is, is so right. Those feelings do come to us for one reason or another. Did you know that the word worry has at its root um, an old Anglo-Saxon word that means to strangle or choke. Isn't that interesting? When you realize the, the root of that word, it, it, it sort of helps frame what Jesus is talking about. It's this kind of toxic worry that can choke us, can strangle us, can, can paralyze us. And it's that kind of worry that we're really talking about today. The kind of worry that that really can, can make you sick. Um, there is, a, there is a, a definition of anxiety that I, that I really like, of, of worry. Uh, and, and it goes like this. Um, worry is a thin stream trickling through the mind that if encouraged cuts a deep ravine into which all emotions are pulled. That's a pretty good definition of this kind of toxic worry. It's that thin stream of fear in the mind that if you encourage, if you feed it, it becomes a stream that cuts a ravine and into that ravine is pulled all sorts of other emotions. It becomes consuming. It, it captivates us. And the result of that can be really detrimental to us. Jesus asked the rhetorical question, which one of you, by worrying, can add one moment to your life? Well, of course, he intends for us to answer, well, not one of us. And of course, that's, that is literally true. Worrying certainly doesn't add a moment to our lives. In fact, it steals moments from our lives as it takes away from living in the present and it can steal moments from our lives in terms of our own longevity, as many studies uh, have shown. It can be toxic. That's that kind of toxic worry that we're really talking about, that we're thinking about today. So what do we do with that? Well, the first thing that Jesus says in our reading that we heard for today is that you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, hate the other, despise, uh, be devoted to one, despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth, or God and mammon is the Aramaic word that means stuff, wealth, possessions, money. And so he begins this section by talking about the thing that can cause us the most worry. And if you look at what people list as the things they worry most about, money is almost always at the top. And it really doesn't matter whether they have a lot of it or not enough of it. Money tends to be that primary concern that causes worry, a kind of ongoing, chronic kind of worry for many people. So Jesus begins at that place and then he transitions with that word, therefore, which tells you that what follows is directly related to what he just said. And what follows is, don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about what you wear. I mean, look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. The birds of the air don't plant seeds, and your heavenly Father feeds them. And, and the lilies, while well, they're... They're more magnificent in colors than King Solomon's robes. Uh, but they don't spin and weave. And God clothes them. And how much more are you than the birds of the air? And how much more important are you than the grass of the field? And so imagine how much more God takes care of you. Now I want you to remember, this is hyperbole. And I want you to remember that Jesus is speaking to people who actually 
had to plant seeds, had to sow, had to work the field. He was speaking to people who had to spin and to weave and to make their clothing. So surely Jesus isn't discounting that work. But it's all about focus and it's about where their priorities are and what captivates their attention. That's why this passage begins with the issue of how we handle resources, how we handle money and the difference that that can make and what life is like when that becomes the main thing and how much that increases our worry. I was reading this week, uh, a, a, a pastor was writing about her dog and she said, my dog has a very strange uh, way of behaving. See, I give my dog, she said, uh, a raw hide bone, and my dog will take it and start digging on the linoleum, trying to bury the bone. And she said, and he'll place the bone on the linoleum, and then he will nose against it like he's nosing dirt, and he'll turn around and, and throw more imaginary dirt on the bone, and then turn around and look at the bone as though something's not quite right. (laughs) And then pick the bone up and take it to another place and start digging in the linoleum again. And she said, I was watching this behavior one day and I thought, I wonder if, I wonder if that's, I wonder if that's what I'm like, really, when it comes down to it. Busy with all kinds of things, worried about all kinds of things going from one thing to another, trying to make something happen and worried about it all the time, afraid, needing to hide something, needing to secure something. It's kind of an image that we might think about for ourselves. So putting money in its place, having our priorities straight. See, Jesus bookends that beginning verse with the call to put first the kingdom of God, to strive for the kingdom of God, to desire the kingdom of God, to to seek first God's kingdom. Remember the kingdom of God is whenever and wherever God's will is done and to work for that and strive for that and seek that. And he's also talking about that in relationship to worry. So as we think about when we are worried sick, as the sermon title says, to the point where it has become toxic for us, then we need to think about what's most important in our lives and where we're placing our priority. Jesus said that's with the kingdom of God. We can think a little bit more about that in a moment. The other thing Jesus says to us in this passage is, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. It's Jesus' call to live today, to let the worries of the day be sufficient, to live life really in the only place we can live life, and that is in the present, today. Because to carry worry from one day to the next and to borrow worry from tomorrow is to make those worries become more and more burdensome. And I speak from experience, friends. I've often said to you, just to remind you, that when I preach, I'm preaching to myself. And this is one of those times, certainly, because this is a difficult one for me. I want to think about what is coming up. I want to look toward tomorrow. And that's fine unless that becomes where I'm trying to live. Or sometimes, for me, not quite as often, I'll look back at, at, at the past and, and want to be in that place. Or wish I could go back to that place maybe to fix something. Some of that, too. But Jesus says, uh, let the days on troubles be sufficient for today. Live life today. There was a lecturer talking about worry and anxiety, and I really like the image that he uses. 
used. He, he uh, held up a glass of water and he asked the people in the audience, how much does this weigh? And people, you know, 12 ounces, 14 ounces, a pound, 18 ounces, they had different answers. And he said, well, it doesn't really matter what, what it weighs. He said, I can uh, hold up this glass uh, for five minutes and my arm will probably start getting tired. He said, if I hold it up for an hour, it'll be hurting. He said, if I hold up this glass for a day, you'll have to call an ambulance. He said, it's not how much the glass weighs. It's how long I'm holding on to it, holding it up. Because as I do, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. He said, that's the way it is with our anxiety. With those anxieties that we carry around with us, they get heavier and heavier and heavier. And so Jesus called to, to live uh, today and let the days on trouble be sufficient for today is a good word for us to hear. And then Jesus does call us to live in the kingdom of God, to put first God's kingdom in righteousness. God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. See, that, that tells us that this is not Jesus telling us not to be concerned. Certainly that's not the truth. But Jesus telling us to have our concerns molded and shaped by that kingdom of God that Jesus imagines, that realm of God that he called people to be a part of, where God's will is done on earth as in heaven. And in doing that, our worries and our anxieties are put into action and lead us to do something and remind us that how we are to live our lives and what we are to do is to follow God's will. And that makes a difference. It leads us not to sit and, and simply try not to think about it, but rather to deal with our worries and anxieties in a way that's much more active in addressing those issues. See, Jesus envisioned this kingdom of God where there is a community of people who support one another and help carry one another's burdens. Jesus envisioned this kingdom of God where, where people share with one another. Remember, Jesus begins this statement talking about the role of money and where we invest ourselves even before the reading that we just heard. It's all the kingdom of God. Put that first. And God's righteousness and God's will and these other things will begin to fall in place. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about the power of community and what that means. Uh, in fact, the power of the community of faith. Wednesday night I finished a meeting and I was walking through the church and there was a grace group meeting in the library. I walked by. There were two or three of us walking from the meeting and we went into the office area and we're just chattering and laughing about something and and Zhenya comes out of her office, shh, there's a grace group in there. And there's a grace group in the little conference room in the main office. And I went upstairs uh, to put something upstairs in one of the rooms uh, on the third floor. And there's a grace group meeting in there where I passed. They're all over the place. A grace group is a group of people who have said, we're going to work together to share lives together, to really talk about what's going on in our faith and to support one another in that and to acknowledge to one another, hey, we share a lot of the same kinds of struggles and, and uh, issues. And, and to hold one another up, to help one another bear the burdens of the other, as Paul says, bear one another's burdens. Well, that's part of Jesus' vision of the kingdom of God. Seek first that. Mr. Mark mentioned prayer a moment ago, and Apostle Paul, you know, he says, uh, don't worry about anything, but in prayer, uh, pray constantly, and in, in prayer, uh, in thanksgiving, make your request be known uh, to God. It all comes down to hope. 
not really optimism necessarily, but it's stronger than that, it's hope. And that distinction between optimism and hope was really driven home to me by a, a quote that I'm about to share with you from William Sloan Coffin that a friend of mine shared with me just the other night. Um, and it goes like this, hope is a state of mind independent of the state of the world. If your heart's full of hope, you can be persistent when you can't be optimistic. You, you can keep the faith despite the evidence, knowing that only in so doing has the evidence any chance of changing. So he said, while I'm not optimistic, I'm always hopeful. I love that. The reminder that it's hope that really nourishes our sense of what is to come. It's hope that gives us strength in the present. It's hope that enables us to put first the kingdom of God and the other things fall in place. There are a lot of lists out there of worries. And then the lists are long. There's a lot to worry about. But I wonder... If you would join me in challenging one another to, to keep a hope list, a list of reasons to be hopeful, because those are out there as well. We just don't seem to hear about them as much. On my list, for example, would be the social uh, consciousness and, uh, and engagement and action of millennials and uh, Generation Z kids. I think that's hopeful. The hope that we express every Sunday, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. A reason to be hopeful. Hope in the body of Christ engaged in, at work in the world. The church engaged in the ways that we are. That ought to be on the hope list. There is that uh, thin stream of fear that trickles through our minds from that quote I shared with you earlier, the definition of anxiety. And so the question is, what are we going to encourage? Are we going to encourage that thin stream in such a way that it becomes that ravine into which all other emotions flow? Or will we do something else? There's a hymn that I want to share with you as we close. These are the words written by George Matheson. He was a well-known um, blind clergy person in Scotland in the 1800s. He wrote the hymn, beautiful hymn, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. He's had a really difficult period of his life and uh, he had uh, a lot to worry about. His list of worries was long. He had every reason to allow worry, that thin stream of fear in his mind, uh, to cut a channel into which so much more of his life would flow. But he didn't do that. Instead, he penned these words that expressed what he chose to focus on and encourage. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. What did he encourage in his own mind? Instead of the thin stream of fear, he focused on the ocean depths, the ocean depths of God's love and grace. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving God, you know our hearts and minds, and you know what we carry with us today and how long we've been carrying it. And we pray for your grace, your strength, the Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives to enable us to let go of that of which we need to let go, to put down some of those burdens we've been carrying to ask others to come alongside and help us carry them and to offer to help carry the burden of a brother or sister. 
O oh God, enable us in our lives to put first your will and your way for our lives. Help us, O oh God, to allow you to help carry the burdens we have, to take those burdens from us and allow us to live each day for this day. And we pray this, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, who taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.